Hi everyone and welcome to Math Sucks. This video is going to help you pass the Algebra 2 Common Core Regents. We're doing this one question at a time. Here is part 2 with question 25. On the axis below, graph y equals 3.2 times 1.8 to the x. So I'm going to take out my calculator, go to y equals, and then plug this in 3.2 times 1.8 to the x. And then we can hit graph and see we're going to draw something like this. So to get the coordinate points, we're just going to go second table, and then we have all these coordinate points. It looks like y equals zero, the x-axis is an asymptote. So it looks like as we were scrolling down, you could see that we never actually hit zero. We just get closer and closer to zero with this picture, right? So this, this line is going to go closer and closer to zero, but never actually hit it. And then this is going to go up. So when we look at this table, so let's start, let's look at 0, 3, 2. So we have 0 and it goes up to 3.2. So let's look over here. 1 is 5.76. So we're going to go to 5.76. That's like around here. 2 is at 10, 30. Okay, so this only goes up to 10. So really this is only going to, this is going to be around like here. So it's a little off the graph. So now let's go back. Let's go to those negative values. Looking at negative 1, x equals negative, we have 1.778, so that's almost 2. Here's like the tricky part to draw where we're going to get closer and closer to 0, but never actually touch the x-axis. Negative 5 is 0.1. Negative 6.0. So you can see where we're going, we're getting, so I'm, not, I'm gonna stop looking at points because if you look, it's gonna be point zeros. It's gonna be kind of impossible for us to draw. So we're just going to, it's a sketch. So we're going to draw something like this. Our line gets closer and close to zero without touching it. And then connect our points here. And then just labeling the graph, y equals 3.2 times 1.8 to the x. And that's our answer. That's all we have to do for question 25. Question 26. Is x plus 3 a factor of 7x cubed plus 27x squared plus 9x minus 27? Justify your answer. So here we're going to be using th synthetic division. And the reason we're using this is we're going to see by using synthetic division if we get a remainder of 0. And if we do, this is going to be a factor. This is all based on the remainder theorem. So to do synthetic division, we're just going to, this is x plus 3, so we're going to take a minus 3 and set up our little box here. And then we're going to take the coefficient of everything of this equation within this box. So we have a 7, a 27, a 9, and a negative 27. And make sure they're in order of power. So we have x cubed, x squared, and x, and then uh, this has no x. Okay, so we're in good shape. We have our setup. And now we're just going to do synthetic division. So we're going to bring this down, which is 7. 7 times negative 3 is negative 21. Then we're going to add these together, which gives us 6. And we're just going to keep this pattern going. So we're going to multiply and then add. Multiply and then add. So notice we have a 0, which means there's no remainder and therefore we could say yes x plus 3 is a factor of this expression because the remainder is 0 and we did synthetic division. Question 27. Over the set of integers factor the expression 2x raised to the fourth minus 10x cubed plus 3x squared minus 15x completely. So let's write this out first. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is factor by grouping. So I'm going to split this up. And then take the greatest common factor of each little unit we have here. So if we just look at 2x to the fourth minus 10x cubed, uh, what's the co greatest common factor we could take out? And that would be 2x to the third, right? So then, then we're just dividing out 
two x to the cubed uh, off of each term and seeing what's left. So two x to the fourth divided by two x cubed. That's only we're only going to have an x left. And then over here, we're only left with a five. Okay, so now let's do the next bit, 3x squared minus 15x, and take the GCF, the greatest common factor, and here we'll be taking out a 3x, and inside we'll have x minus 5. When doing factor by grouping, you want to make sure that you end up with the same thing inside the parentheses. So notice we have an x minus 5 here, and an x minus 5 here, and we're going to bring that down, x minus 5. And the other thing you're going to bring down is what what is outside the parentheses. So outside we have a 2x cubed and a 3x. So we're just kind of combining everything. So we have this x minus 5 and then we have this 2x cubed plus 3x. Okay, the last thing we can do, there's one more thing we can do here because they said to factor completely. So notice this, another GCF could be taking out, not doing factor by grouping again, but just the GCF. So we can take out an x here. If you look at this, we have an x times a 2x squared plus 3. So if you distributed this, this would end up the same. And that's how you know you factored correctly. But this is our answer. We have x minus 5 times x times 2x squared plus 3. So if you wanted to put this in like a nicer looking order, maybe you would do something like this for your final answer. But it, it's all the same thing. Question 28. The monthly unemployment rate of towns in the United States is approximately normally distributed with a mean rate of 5.2%. So we have a mu of 5.2% and a standard deviation of 1.6%. Determine the percentage of towns to the nearest integer that have a monthly unemployment rate greater than 6%. So we're looking for something with greater than 6% unemployment rate. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a little picture of what we're doing here and then we're going to end up using the information uh, that we they gave us on the calculator. So we, this is a stand, they said it was approximately normally distributed. So I just sketched out a normal curve here of this is a normal distribution where the mean is 5.2% and then the standard deviation where we go above or below the mean is 1.6%. So one standard deviation above the mean would be 5.2 plus 1.6. So this this over here is 6.8%. And then like one standard deviation below the mean would be 5.2 minus 1.6%. Okay, so, so we found these different things above and below the mean, but what they really want to know is this what what's what's the employment rate unemployment rate greater than six percent so we want to know something along here six percent which probably somewhere in here the percentage of towns in the nearest integer so they want it of that have greater than six percent unemployment so everything's six percent and above so what we're going to do is use this information that they gave us so we're going to go to second bars, because notice that says distribution. Second bars, normal CDF, which is choice number two. And then they have we have this lower, this upper, the mu, the standard deviation. Okay, so we know our mu is 5.2, right? I, ha I actually have it in here already. Our standard deviation is 1.6. And then for the lower, we know the lower bound of what we want is 6%. And then since this is in percentage, we know that the upper bound can only go up to 100. So our upper bound is going to be 100, right? Because these are all in percentages. So the highest possible thing you could get for a percentage is 100. Okay, now we just press enter and we get this value 0.3085375322. And what we're going to do with that is that's a decimal, right? But they want they want a percentage to the nearest integer. So we're going to multiply this number times 100 to get a percentage. And we do that to the nearest integer, we're going to get 31%. Right? It's 30, but they want it to the nearest integer. 
So we're just gonna round up and we get 31%, which is our answer. Question 29. The function d of t equals two cosine of pi over six times t plus five models the water depth in feet at a location in a bay t hours since the last high tide. Determine the minimum water depth of the location in feet and justify your answer. Let's get into this equation. Let's look at what we're finding. So this equation represents water depth. So when you think about a cosine function, it looks something like this. So the they're saying the water depth, it can be represented by a cosine equation, meaning like the tide goes in and out and uh, the water levels keep rising and lowering, right? So that just a reminder of what we're looking at, water, water levels in a bay. So now it's saying determine the minimum water depth of the location. So we're looking for the lowest point. So what point does this fall at? That's kind of what we're at asking. What point, what point is this? Right, this is the minimum of our graph. Okay, so now we can take a look at our trig function. I'm gonna rewrite it here, d of t equals. So just a reminder of the different parts of a cosine function. There's this two, this represents the amplitude. And then this represents the frequency, period and the frequency. We're, we're actually not gonna really need that for this question. What we're gonna be paying attention is the amplitude and then this number over here, which is the vertical shift up. So if we're looking for levels going up and down, we're gonna be focusing on the amplitude and the vertical shift up. So if I just like started to draw out this trig function, so the amplitude is where a graph usually starts, unless there's a vertical shift up. And in this case there is. So like usually we would start uh, a cosine function at two, right? So here's like a rough drawing of our trig function. And notice that the minimum number goes to negative two, a vertical shift up. And because of that, we're gonna have to imagine this point up five units. So this point at negative two, we have to imagine where it would go in five units. So if we went one, two, three, four, five, you see that it would end up at three, which is our answer. So we have, we have this answer, which is three. And that was based on moving this, this minimum number negative two up five units because of the vertical shift and we get three. I also have a ton of videos on trig functions and how to map them out, so please check that out. Question 30. A brewed cup of coffee contains 130 milligrams of caffeine. The half-life of caffeine in the bloodstream is five and a half hours. Write a function C of T to represent the amount of caffeine in the bloodstream T hours after drinking one cup of coffee. So here, it seems like this is gonna be an exponential decay function. And I knew that because it says that there's 130 milligrams of caffeine and then the half-life happens every five and a half hours. So the half-life means that the caffeine level is gonna cut in half every five and a half hours. So knowing that we can write a little exponential decay function. So, so there's a formula for that. F of X is equal to A times one minus R to the T, where A is our initial value our initial amount of caffeine, which we know is 130 milligrams, and then R, y, one minus R, is the rate of decrease. They didn't give us a number, a specific number, but they said the words half-life, which means this is going to half, so we know the rate is going to be 0.5. And then T, this is the time in hours. You have to be careful about this. Whatever time and hours we're given, we're gonna be dividing it by 5.5 because we wanna know when this does half, it would be every five and a half hours. And that would be based on, so whatever number you plug in here, divided by 5.5, that'll be the rate of the decrease of the initial amount. So that's like the only little tricky part about this question. So now we can put this all together. We have 130 one minus 0. 0.5, and then this is gonna be raised to the T over 5.5. And that's our answer. Question 31. 
Marcus is a long distance walker. In one race, he walked 55 miles in T hours and another race walked 65 miles in T plus three hours. His rates are shown below in each equation. Marcus walked an equivalent rate R for each race. So this is a key point, equivalent R for each race. Determine the number of hours that each of the two races took. So basically, we're, this question is saying that the, these R's are equal to each other, but then they want us to find the number of hours each took. So they're, the rates are equal, but the hours are different. And they want us to find like these the T and then the T plus three. So since they're equal, we can actually just set these equal to each other and then do cross multiplying. So we have 55 over T, and then we have 65 over T plus three. And then we could do some cross multiplying. And then just treat this like a normal algebraic function. Sixteen point five equals t, and then we're also going to need to take that t to find the number of hours for the other rate, which would just be sixteen point five plus three which would give us 19.5. And those are our answers. Question 32. Solve the equation x squared plus 3x plus 11 equals 0 algebraically. Express the answer in a plus bi form. So we have to do this algebraically, and because they gave us this a plus bi form, this is our clue that we're going to be needing the quadratic equation. So if we have... So this is our equation, and then I'm just going to write on the side here what everything equals uh, for this formula. a is equal to 1, b is equal to 3, so just taking the coefficients from these, and then c is equal to 11. And now we could plug these numbers into our formula. So x is equal to negative 3 plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times 1. So to solve this, I'd like to do this one step at a time, always starting with everything that's under the radical. So you could take that. So I'm just going to skip ahead and do 3 squared, which is 9 minus 4 times 11. And we get negative 35 over 2. And then write the rule for negatives under a radical or a no-no. So we're going to have to take out an i. So this is going to be negative 3 plus or minus i times radical 35 this can't be reduced anymore right because 35 is only divisible by 7 and 5 so that that's no good and then this is all over 2 and then to just split this up a little bit more we can move this denominator out so we could have negative 3 halves plus or minus i radical 35 over 2. so this is the end of part two Look out for part three coming out soon. Please let me know if you have any questions below. Good luck and happy calculating. Need more practice? Check out mathsucks.org for more questions. Link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe. Happy calculating.